In 2017, Bitcoin shocked the world stage in what could only be seen as one of the most significant financial rallies in human history. Bitcoin rallied 20 times its original value in 2017 alone, and everyone, including their grandmother, was talking about it at the time. But it wasn't alone. Cryptocurrencies as a whole finally became realized as an emerging currency class by many in the financial sector. And with the rise of crowdfunded projects through ICOs, it seemed that there was a great opportunity at every corner, with new altcoins arriving by the day, sparking an entirely new bubble of theories and ideas labeled with new, emerging, and exciting names and logos. However, soon thereafter, markets were exhausted and valuations had become far too overextended in relation to their fundamental value. People began realizing the many flaws and empty promises of the once-held visions many investors were originally sold on. And because of this, 15 long months of a bear market dragged on from Bitcoin's peak in December of 2017. However, in April of 2019, when most had lost hope in cryptocurrencies as a whole, markets rebounded with an immense two days of buy-side activity, marking the starting point to what would become one of the fastest recoveries for Bitcoin. To put it simple, the tone has changed, and to this day, as Bitcoin sets out on a course to revisit all-time highs and eventually head towards new highs, this has left many asking, what are the next projects set to outpace Bitcoin? Will the altcoin market recover, and if so, who will be its champions? Well, that's what we're going to be talking about in today's video. Join me as we conduct a deep dive through the crypto space and plan for the next upcoming altcoin cycle. The first thing to note is that this is not financial advice. Anything I say here is solely my opinion, and you should listen to a variety of other viewpoints as well as doing your own research before making any investments. That being said, guys, let's go ahead and get started. Before we dive into our top 10 picks for 2020, it's important to know how the environment has changed, and more specifically, to get an idea of how this cycle will differ from the last. Though there is no way of predicting exactly how the future will be, the near 10-year history of crypto, as well as hundreds of years of financial history, can tell us a few things that we can be relatively certain on. For example, as markets grow larger, they tend to multiply at lower rates over time. This is especially true in the case of crypto, which is still a relatively new market. In the last cycle, we saw many projects outpace Bitcoin at a rate 25 to 40 times greater. And bear in mind, Bitcoin had already done a 20x. Talk about a return. However, this is easily explained. Most altcoins began from nothing or minute valuations in the low millions. This time around, many of the leaders we'll be watching aren't starting from the ground up and will require much more liquidity or buyers to lead valuations higher. And that leads us to the next essential point, one that I believe many people won't want to hear but I feel need to hear. If the dot-com bubble teaches us anything, it's that many of the names we have today will not be around in years' time. To put it simple, don't chase after coins or tokens that are down 98 to 99% from their all-time highs simply because they're at a discount. Many of them will never come back. Look for players who have either kept up with Bitcoin or held strong through the bear market. And though it seems that this market is anything but fundamental sometimes, look for projects with legitimate demand and token models that will benefit if the network is being used. Projects will likely need this to draw serious institutional and user adoption, not to mention if the blockchain platform really does have utility that can be adopted and used, there should be proof of it inside the token price. And last but not least, it's important to understand when we can expect another altcoin cycle to arrive. History tells us that the last two ones were during periods where money was exiting out of Bitcoin, one where we revisited the previous highs at 1100 and when we set out all new highs at 20000 Our best guess is that it will happen sometime slightly before or after we revisit $20,000 for Bitcoin's price and altcoins have truly felt the pain with Bitcoin dominance overextended. So now that we understand some of the fundamental differences from previous cycles, as well as when we can expect the upcoming cycle to arrive, let's go ahead and start diving into the top 10 picks that I have on my watch list going into 2020. Now bear in mind two key things guys, if your coin or token is not on this list, it doesn't mean I think it's a bad project, I can only really select about 10 coins and tokens here, but along with that, I want to emphasize that there are going to be a lot of great projects that come down the road, and I'll be sure to review them here on the channel when they do come. So, without further ado, let's go ahead and get started with number 10. Number 10, Steam. 
Now, many of you out there have possibly heard about the Steam blockchain in the past as it's been around in the cryptocurrency space for some time. However, it does have some major accolades outside of that, from having over a million registered users, as well as being one of the most active blockchains in the ecosystem. And it all comes together and makes sense when you understand what Steam is trying to do. It's an app-centric blockchain that's focused on providing social media services and a variety of other types of forms of entertainment and communication on the internet. And for many, Steemit.com is the only thing that comes to mind when people think about Steam. However, it's a vibrant ecosystem with a variety of other applications being built on top of the blockchain to provide different types of services. One of the platforms on the Steam blockchain that I currently use is 3speak.online, which allows a variety of content creators, including myself, to upload content on just about anything we want to talk about. And the cool thing about this is that it provides a platform for people who have either been demonetized or removed from traditional social media or content outlets. But along with this, it gives people a way to earn for providing good content. And that's the big message with Steam here. Steam's philosophy is to have an open, free, and fair internet that allows anyone to participate. And for those who create engaging content that people actually enjoy and respond to, that they be rewarded for it in Steam. And the platform has taken its vision a step further with the creation of smart media tokens, which are very similar in nature to ERC20 tokens on the Ethereum blockchain, however are based on the Steam blockchain and are much more focused on cutting friction for users as well as being able to reward people for creating engaging content or being active participants on that given ecosystem on the Steam blockchain. And though the Steam blockchain isn't perfect, I believe it's not only a step in the right direction, but they've been able to do some really cool things over the last few years. Not to mention, they've got a lot of different proposals and ideas coming through the pipeline over the next few months that will help to continue expanding the platform. I don't have all the time to talk about it, however, I will leave a lot of links down below in the description that continue to build out on what we've discussed and showcases that there are a lot of exciting things in store for the project. Number 9, Dash. Now for those of you out there who are religious viewers of my channel, you've probably heard me mention Dash too many times to count, and there's good reason for it. Because Dash is aiming to be a leader in what I believe is one of the best use cases for cryptocurrencies, and that is purely digital cash, hence the name Dash. So what makes Dash stand out compared to its competition in the peer-to-peer -peer digital currency space? Well, for starters, Dash has a pretty decent track record behind it. In a space that's only been around for about 10 years, Dash has been existing for about 5.5 years. And ever since then, it's continued to grow its community, technology, and on a general annual basis, its price. However, this isn't just due to rampant speculation and a fancy logo. Dash has actually been able to push some huge innovations in the cryptocurrency space that's put it towards the top. One of those huge innovations that it's put in is the Dash Treasury. Now, to simplify what the Dash Treasury is, it's basically a self-funding mechanism where some of the inflated currency or the new currency that gets minted into the supply goes into a governance treasury where select few individuals who hold a large stake of Dash get to vote on how those funds are used. This can be used to pay for marketing efforts, developer work, all kinds of different things to expand the Dash network as well as its utility. And this is one of the coolest mechanisms I've still found to date in the cryptocurrency space. Now, Dash isn't the only one using this model. However, it has been one of the most successful, and a good test subject case of using this treasury would be the use case where they basically self-funded operations in Venezuela, where they hire teams of individuals to go out and promote the Dash network to merchants, and were able to, in a bear market in 2018, 5x their merchant adoption, mostly in Venezuela, where it's most needed right now, a country that's facing a currency crisis. And along with this, Dash offers private and instant send transactions, meaning that you can not only have instant confirmation when you send value over the network, but along with that can pay extra if you'd like to send a private transaction. And in Dash's most recent update, Dash Evolution version 0.14, the network now utilizes a technology known as chain locks that help to prevent 51% attacks from ever happening on the Dash network, which is really exciting for security concerns. So again, I recommend you guys look a little bit deeper into it, but Dash is definitely setting itself out to be a leader in the peer-to-peer -peer digital currency space. Number eight, Engine Coin. Now, many of you have possibly heard about Engine Coin in the past few months as it landed one of the largest partnerships in cryptocurrency history with Samsung, one of the largest mobile phone providers in the world. And this would basically mean that with all new Samsung Galaxy S10s, that the Engine Wallet would be shipped on the device, reaching tens of millions of users across the world. 
but they also landed a really solid partnership with Unity, one of the largest software development kits in the gaming sector, allowing people on the Unity SDK to instantly develop in-game items that they could collect and store within their engine wallet. And this is what Engine is all about. It aims to simplify the process of creating in-game items or digital assets for game developers so that they can reach them out to their users and allow them to utilize these assets in different ways that they previously couldn't. To me, this is a relatively unique proposition because I know that there's not only a growing number of gamers across the world, but over the years, I've been absolutely stunned to see just how much people are willing to spend on in-game items. Because to be fair, a lot of people do spend multiple hours inside these virtual worlds. And much like in the real world where we might buy clothes or different types of status symbols, it's understandable why people would spend money on digital goods that they can show off to other gamers in the ecosystem. So to me, I think Engine is definitely a leader in this space. Time will have to tell if they can get some killer titles using the platform in order to launch digital assets for its users. But if we already see the success of games like Counter-Strike, as well as other competitive games out there that have a variety of skins and in-game items, I think Engine is well-placed so long as they have the easiest process on the market. To me personally, the biggest leverage that Engine holds at the moment is its partnership with Samsung, and the fact that it already reaches tens of millions of users, therefore giving a big incentive for game developers to work with the Engine network and start experimenting with digital assets such as NFTs, which are non-fungible tokens that allow for unique ownership over specific items. And when we take a look at the chart here, there's a few interesting things to notice on the long-term time frame. There's been two major rallies, one from the announcement from Samsung, as well as the general bull run back in the later part of 2017. And along with that, it has very parabolic run-ups as well as pretty stark corrections, both in its USD comparative as well as compared to Bitcoin. And as of recent, we've recently gotten back to a correction range that was very similar back to the last correction back in 2018. So I think this is at a range where we could start to possibly find some value for engine coin. And hopefully over the next few months and years, we start to see some serious development on the platform and a lot of games utilizing the engine token in order to generate in-game assets. Number seven, Ethereum. Now, some of you might be confused by this pick, and many of you might be asking questions like, Nick, why is it that in your top 10 list for 2020, you're including a cryptocurrency that's not only well known by most people in the crypto space, but along with that is the second largest in the sense of market valuation? Can it continue to grow? And I think these are really good questions, and I'll not only explain why I fundamentally believe Ethereum has the fundamental game plan to continue growing throughout 2020, but along with that, I want to drive home the point here that I made earlier on in the video, and that is that you want to find players in this market that are already well established. There will not be much room for new players to enter and to dominate in this market. So we need to look for those who have already established themselves. And Ethereum, with the largest developer community in the cryptocurrency space, sets itself on top with thousands of developers across the world building on top of the network. But even with this developer community, I used to be highly critical of Ethereum because it seemed that, at least in 2017 and 2018, most of the valuation it was being given was due to the fact that it was being used as a conduit to raise capital or crowdfund through ICOs. However, in 2019 and going into 2020, the space has been maturing and Ethereum seems to have found its next thing to chase with some actual substance and real utility. And this is what's known as the DeFi or decentralized finance movement. Many people still don't understand what the DeFi movement really is, but to put it in practical terms, the DeFi movement is a collection of different projects in the cryptocurrency and blockchain ecosystem that are aiming to bring about decentralized open access financial services, such as insurance, decentralized exchanging, as well as stable coins, allowing people to have stable value on a blockchain network. And the movement is made up of many interesting projects ranging from names such as the ZeroX Protocol, MakerDAO, Compound, and a variety of others that you've probably heard of before, and maybe even some that you haven't heard of before. Two of the things that have gotten me really excited about the DeFi movement are MakerDAO's stablecoin DAI and the Compound platform. To put it simple, DAI is a decentralized stablecoin that uses a variety of techniques to mask the value of the dollar. However, unlike its competitors such as Paxos and TrueUSD, it doesn't have a 1 to 1 pegged ratio of cash and reserves to back up each generated coin. 
Instead, it uses a collateralization of Ethereum that's deposited into the DAI smart contract, so that when Ethereum is deposited into the contract, people are able to generate DAI. Now, there's a lot of interesting use cases for this, but the coolest thing about DAI itself is that it creates censorship resistant dollars, seeing as the reserve in this case that backs DAI or is collateralizing the creation of the DAI is Ethereum and cannot be stripped or censored from the network, we now have censorship resistant dollars, which allows for people across the world to have dollars that can't be censored by corrupt governments. Along with this as well, there's platforms like Compound, which allow you to lend out not only DAI, but a variety of other ERC-20 tokens and your Ethereum to earn interest. And on the Compound network, even though rates are variable, you're able to lend out your DAI in this case to Compound, which again is simply just a smart contract where you'll be able to earn annual levels of interest. And the really interesting thing about it is that there's no third party that's really managing or controlling the process. It's all open source in the code through the smart contract that's been deployed. This really plays into the whole term decentralized finance. And again, we're just scratching the surface. There's a lot of interesting projects that are joining in on the movement and continuing to expand what I believe is the most important aspect of cryptocurrencies, which is the open access to financial services and sound money. Number six, Litecoin. Now, similar to Ethereum, I know that Litecoin already is pretty well known in the crypto space and already has a massive community around the cryptocurrency. But I not only see these things as a benefit to Litecoin in the long term, in the sense that it's already built out a solid foundation, but along with that as well, Litecoin has a lot of advantages to it that aren't so much rooted in the technical side of things, but more in the side of its potential. Outside of the fact that Litecoin is potentially considering to implement Mimblewimble by the end of 2020, which is a privacy technology that I'm really interested in, I'm much more interested in the fact that Litecoin is going to be a prime candidate for institutional liquidity in the next cycle. Litecoin has a lot of similarities to Bitcoin, not only in the sense that it's been around in the crypto space for some time, but along with that as well, that Litecoin itself was founded in the same way that Bitcoin was. It was all mined through proof of work rather than an ICO or an IEO, giving it a great regulatory framework to be able to be added to financial products similar to Bitcoin. And really at the end of it all, it really starts to become clear that many are seeing Litecoin equivalent to Bitcoin as they would see silver to gold as a secondary store of value in the cryptocurrency space. And we actually have some data to back up this claim. For example, when we take a look at precious metals markets, we can see that there's a very well-known indicator, and that is the gold-silver ratio. It's basically how many ounces of silver you can buy with one ounce of gold. And the whole idea here is that we've seen over history that there's commonalities in the sense of where we find the ratio as a buy signal for silver, and then also as a sell signal for silver being overextended. And even though we have less than six years of pricing data to compare Bitcoin to Litecoin, we can see that there is a very common ratio between the two currencies. Now to simplify how to read this chart, when we're at a ratio range of 140 to 160, this usually means that Litecoin is oversold or undervalued comparative to Bitcoin. As we've seen historically, when we reach this range in most cases, it usually has a sharp reversal with Litecoin gaining ground and lowering the ratio. Now when we get back into a range where we're at 40 to 60, this is usually when Litecoin is overextended. We've seen this historically not only as of recent with the recent rally for the Litecoin block happening, but along with that as well, in the previous peak back in the later part of 2017 and in the early part of 2017 during the rally in April and May, where Litecoin gained a lot of ground in the open market. So again, this ratio should be taken into account when we're trying to find the general times to go bullish on Litecoin. Again, it's not a full all bet that this is a time to buy Litecoin. We've seen that there are some extended periods, for example, from the early part of September going in to January of 2017, where Litecoin continued to lose out to Bitcoin quite sharply past the normal range. But it is definitely something we should factor in. It can usually give us a good guiding point as to whether or not there's a good risk to reward profile going long on Litecoin versus Bitcoin. Number five, REN. Now, REN is one of the few projects as of recent that have really garnered my attention in the cryptocurrency space. And more specifically, it's one of the few small caps that I actually feel comfortable placing in my top 10 list for 2020. The reason being, it's at a current comfortable valuation of around $72 million. And along with that as well, I feel still has a lot of room to expand in both its retail and institutional audience as it's really been kind of hiding behind the scenes and hasn't been marketing itself too much. 
RIN, or previously known by its former name, Republic Protocol, is an open protocol that provides access to inter-blockchain liquidity for all decentralized applications. At its start, RIN had the objective of providing decentralized dark pools, a means of exchanging privately without the need of trusting an intermediary to facilitate the transaction. This not only means you would be able to transact privately in a peer-to-peer -peer fashion like decentralized exchanges provide, but that you could do so cross-chain. So in other words, I can not only trade Ether for an ERC-20 token that's based on the Ethereum network, but I could also trade Ether to Bitcoin, Bitcoin to Zcash, etc. Basically, I could transfer any coin or token between any blockchain, providing ultimate liquidity. And not to mention, RIN has some pretty impressive alkylades. It can process transactions 100 times faster than traditional atomic swaps due to the fact that with atomic swaps, you can have your funds locked for over 24 hours before the transaction is complete. Not to mention, it integrates into existing infrastructure, so there's no need for other systems to adapt to RIN's network. And it provides high-level security for transactions, something highly desirable for cross-chain large-scale transactions, such as OTC orders. And as we see a rise in the DeFi movement, I believe that RIN will serve as a fundamental backbone to the decentralized finance movement in order to provide liquidity, match orders, and connect various blockchains, all in a permissionless and private manner. Now, even though I don't have enough time to explain exactly how it works behind the scenes, RIN utilizes a lot of amazing time-tested technologies that I'm personally a big fan of, such as zero-knowledge proofs which help to mask the information of the transaction, and Shamir's secret sharing, otherwise known as key sharding when it's commonly used for cryptocurrency wallet management. But in this case, it's being utilized so that the only two people who really know the full scale and data of the transaction are the two parties at the end of it all. And with every token, we have to think about where's the fundamental demand going to come from. Well, from what I can analyze, demand for the token is driven by traders who want to prioritize fulfillment of transactions, and dark nodes who need to stake a certain amount to match transactions and earn for their work in the long term. So if the network continues to grow in adoption, there will be those who want to run dark nodes and earn tokens on the network. In summary, I know that RIN's in its early days, but I do believe that the project has a lot of potential going into the later part of 2020, not only because the technology is already working right now and it's well thought out from the start, but along with that, you're welcome to take a look at RIN Exchange, which allows you to swap in between different cryptocurrencies that you like in a decentralized manner. So if you guys want to check it out, feel free to. Now, in the sense of technical analysis, there's no key patterns that I'm looking at in regards to its trend. However, it has been one of the better performers in 2019, which is already a good sign to me. But it also has enough liquidity behind it from exchanges like Binance and Huobi. And I hope to see more exchange listings coming down the road for the coin. In summary, so long as REN can continue to improve the user interface of its exchange, continue to see more REN integrations into DeFi apps, and draw in more institutional interest from the OTC space, I really do see a lot of use case and demand for the token going into 2020. And by that time frame, I do believe we could print a billion dollar valuation for the currency, which would mean a 14x comparative to its current USD value at the time of recording. Number 4. Energy now, most of you out there probably know that my favorite application for cryptocurrencies is money, and though it may sound simple on the surface, the sheer ability to store value in an agreed upon framework, basically speaking, a network with a limited supply, and being able to send and transmit that value to anyone in the world in a censorship resistant nature is extremely powerful. And energy takes this to the next level by implementing a lot of the things that have worked in the cryptocurrency space to build money for the 21st century. Over the last few years being involved in the cryptocurrency space, I've thought deeply about what I would desire in my ideal version of a peer-to-peer -peer digital currency, and energy checks off a lot of those boxes. One of the things that energy got right from the get-go that a lot of projects haven't tried is their earn drop campaign, wherein they basically are airdropping the vast majority of the initial currency supply to a variety of users across the world free of charge. This is not only great because it brings in a ton of people into the ecosystem with an incentive to build value for energy and to spread the word, but along with that as well, they never conducted an ICO or an IEO. They haven't raised a dime of capital, and all of the initial development was funded by the 
the founder of the project, Tommy World Power, who's yet again another crypto YouTuber. And I think this is really ironic in a sense because Tommy and I see so much eye to eye. We've seen a lot of projects come and go in the space. We've seen what works and what doesn't. And Tommy realizes that money is not only a killer application for crypto, but that there's a few select technologies that work really well, as well as methods that need to be implemented to make it succeed in the long term. One of the things that I think Tommy really got right from the get-go with his vision for energy is that it must have a well-funded treasury. Tommy realized that there was such a vast amount of potential behind the Dash treasury. And within the energy network, even though its market capitalization or the coin's value is lower than Dash technically, its treasury is already bringing in more revenue than Dash on a monthly basis, giving it a huge war chest to market itself, to bring on developers, and also integrate a variety of different services and build out the energy ecosystem system, which I think is very important for any early stage currency. If we really think about it, Bitcoin and most other cryptocurrencies don't have this kind of mechanism where some of the inflated currency goes to a governance model or treasury that can help expand the network, which can be a really big lagging effect if you don't have something like that. And even for ICOs, ICOs eventually run out of money. They run out of the Ethereum that they raised. How can you sustain long-term growth? And that's one of the biggest things they have. Now, outside of this as well, there's some really big future ambitions. They have Energy 3.0, which aims to bring about decentralized exchange services through Energy X, their exchange system. And along with that as well, to be able to have programmable smart contracts on top of the energy network as they start to fork off of the Ethereum code base. So it's going to be really exciting to see if some of the existing projects on Ethereum move over to the energy ecosystem. Number three, Ravencoin. Now, some of you out there have possibly heard about Ravencoin over the last few months as it's been gaining popularity, and for me it easily made it into my top 3 due to its good mixture of both technical price action with some of the best performance and the sense of altcoins in late 2018 and 2019, as well as a good set of fundamentals and its shared ambition of tokenizing assets. And I think it's very clear that from 2018 to 2019, the topic of tokenizing assets has only grown larger. However, it's turned out that most of the competitors in this space, especially those focused on specifically tokenizing securities, have gone yet again to the centralized approach that most systems that currently exist already utilize. So when something like Ravencoin comes along, which has this cypherpunk nature to it of a completely decentralized and censorship resistant asset network, I get really excited. And that's exactly what Ravencoin aims to be, a borderless, censorship-resistant platform to tokenize assets from project shares to virtual goods, physical and digital assets, as well as credit and other financial products. From the get-go, it was really good to see a variety of individuals that I already knew on the team, from people such as Bruce Fenton, Tron Black, and Joel Wright, helping to head up the project in its early stages. And with the fact that it came with no pre-mine, ICO or IEO, and is ASIC resistant and a fork of the Bitcoin network, everything seemed to check off pretty good. It seemed as if this was the missing piece that the Bitcoin network decided not to implement years ago with the use of things such as colored coins as well as sidechains. It was finally going to be the version of Bitcoin for tokenizing assets. Another thing that I think is important to note is that someone who I really admire, Patrick Byrne, is an early supporter and investor in the technology of Ravencoin. Patrick Byrne has a very successful track record of founding Overstock.com, which is a large e-commerce website, as well as founding T0, which is one of the largest security platforms for cryptocurrencies. So I think this is a really good sign that there's something behind this technology. And in the grand scheme of things, the reason Ravencoin really excites me, and I can only see why Ravencoin excites Patrick Byrne, is that this seems to me like Bitcoin was for money. Whereas most security platforms or tokenizing asset platforms are based on centralized frameworks and traditional frameworks of governance, this seems to be a platform that is going around that system, that is going to try to build a framework where we can tokenize just about anything in this world that we can in a censorship resistant way and in a trustless manner as well that doesn't rely on central authorities or third parties. And I don't think we could have picked a better time to talk about Ravencoin because it not only recently set a third higher low on its long-term comparative chart to Bitcoin, but along with that has had a near 80% retracement from the highs compared to Bitcoin, which is historically a range where we can expect Ravencoin to be a buy comparative to Bitcoin. At least history shows us this. Number two, basic attention token, or BAT as it's commonly referred to as. 
Now, over the last month or two, I've started to talk a lot more about basic attention token. It's become one of my larger positions in my altcoin portfolio. The reason for this is because I've had a complete 180 on the potential of the token, as well as its tied platforms in the last few months. So what exactly is BAT? Well, before we go about trying to understand what BAT is, it's important to understand the problem that it's trying to solve. Currently, we live in a world where when we browse the web, large corporations collect our data to service matching advertisements. Google being one of the largest examples, bringing in $30.7 billion in profit alone in 2018. However, at the end of it all, you don't get to see any of it. Even worse, content creators who draw activity to these ads in the first place, such as website publishers or YouTubers like myself, make roughly half the cut, with Google taking up to 45% from advertising revenue on YouTube alone. So as we can obviously see, there's a lot of problems for both users and content producers when it comes to the economic model of the attention economy. And this is exactly what Brendan Eich, the founder of the BAT project, set out to fix from the get-go. Now, Brendan has been around the block when it comes to web development. He's not only known for co-founding the Mozilla project, which helped develop the Firefox browser, but along with that has led the development for the JavaScript programming language. So Brendan not only has a good knowledge of how it is to interact with web browsers, but all of the inefficiencies as well that are currently rooted in the system that we use day to day. And as Brendan has started to collaborate with other team members on the project, they've come up with a token model that has a fighting chance at actually disrupting the inefficient system that we have for the attention economy. The basic attention token services all three necessary parties, the advertiser, the user, and the content creator. And it works in tangent with the new Brave browser that the team has built that allows you to either browse with ads or without ads on the platform. So let's go ahead and see how this all comes together and start off by taking a look at the advertiser. Now the advertiser has one simple goal and that is to get ads in front of users on the Brave browser. So all they have to simply do is buy basic attention token and utilize it to purchase ad space on the platform. Now it's important to understand that they're setting the driving demand for the token long term. As the coin supply is limited and you have a growing user base on the browser, you have more attention to service, meaning that the token inevitably has to go up over time if the platform is reaching more adoption. So this is a really interesting model. If the Brave browser can continue to expand, the token's value fundamentally should expand as well, so long as the value of those viewers continues to remain the same or increase over time. And users of the Brave browser who consent to advertisements receive up to 70% of the revenue generated from the ad that they viewed. And it's cool not only because you're receiving the vast majority of economic wealth generated by your attention, but along with that as well, you can use the BAT tokens to support content creators from website publishers to YouTubers that you like. And if you'd like to learn more about this, guys, I'll go ahead and leave a link down below to the Brave browser. And if you like the content I produce here on the channel, feel free to go to the top bar, click on my Brave icon indicated in the links bar, and you'll be able to support the channel. Now, in the sense of talking about the longer term aspects of the BAT token and the Brave browser, I've got a lot of things I'm looking forward to. One of my general concerns I held for the Brave browser over the last few months was that it was only desktop client users who were able to receive ads and therefore ad revenue. However, as of recent, the Brave team has announced that a new update on the Brave browser on Android now allows you to run ads and earn ad revenue. And I think that iOS is coming quite soon after. Not to mention as well, I think there's going to be a really unique combination between Brave and Bat in the sense of solving the issue of content subscriptions. A lot of news sites as well as YouTubers can't get by without some form of donations. And I think that Brave is really going to provide that framework for them through Bat. And last but not least, as we referred to earlier, there is a limited supply of BAT available, and the circulating supply that's on the open market is nearing its total supply. This means that as advertisers continue to want to be able to reach people on the Brave platform, that one individual BAT token will likely buy more users on the platform, meaning that it's going to reach more attention and have more fundamental value behind it. So in this case, it does pay off to be an early adopter if the platform continues to grow over the long term. In short summary, I not only believe that Brave is going to continue to grow from the already millions of users that are using it, but I also see a lot more utility coming for Bat as we start to see Bat not only being used in the Brave browser, but in other unique ways as a utility token for advertising. So I'm excited to see what the Brave team has in store, but let's go ahead and dive in to our number one coin. Number one, Chainlink. 
Now, I know what many of you may be thinking, am I bullish on the endless abode of memes that are made around the project? Perhaps I'm confident due to their diehard community who never gives up on the original vision of the project, or is it that, through all the noise, that there is potentially something game-changing beneath the surface that will be an essential part of the ecosystem if enterprise blockchain becomes a reality? That's what I want to talk about today, and even as someone who's more excited about the direct financial applications of blockchain, i.e. money and assets, even I can see the immense potential in the project. With every new cycle of cryptocurrencies, there tends to be a revolutionary or game-changing technology, and in the case of 2016 and 17, Ethereum stole the stage. With its introduction of smart contracts, we were not only able to generate new forms of value on a public ledger that was highly secure, but along with that, we were able to exchange value in very unique ways, in fact, in programmable frameworks through smart contracts. So this all sounds great on paper, but what's the catch? What prevented Ethereum from reaching its full potential back in 2017? The issue lies in the fact that we haven't been able to make smart contracts, well, smart. Let me better explain this. Right now, if enterprises want to utilize smart contracts, they need sound data. Blockchains are great, but they're limited in terms of the way they reach consensus on a distributed network. At the current moment, consensus can only be met over the readily available data that it has, which in most cases is data already present within the blockchain or on-chain information, such as transaction values, timestamps, type of value, i.e. Ether or ERC20 tokens, etc. On their own, they can't listen to data from the outside world, what is commonly referred to as external or off-chain data. For example, if someone created a derivative smart contract based off the market price of some asset, the outside world could feed the smart contract five different prices since not all exchanges list the asset at the same price. This would confuse the consensus mechanism of the blockchain since the blockchain cannot mathematically determine which data source is correct since it came from outside the blockchain. This is referred to as the Oracle problem, and its shortcomings limit smart contracts to a niche market of simply sending tokens already programmed into the blockchain back and forth. Blockchains and smart contracts are also limited by not being able to push their data onto other networks. This means they can't trigger actions on external systems or backend infrastructure that companies may be currently using. If a blockchain can't communicate with the existing frameworks for supply chain management, financial markets, and regulatory systems, enterprise use case for smart contracts becomes practically non-existent. But this is where Chainlink comes in. Chainlink solves the Oracle problem by servicing a middleware solution between traditional systems and blockchains. Using a decentralized network of oracles that connect to the outside world using APIs, they feed their answers to smart contracts, which aggregates the data into a single weighted answer that can be fed into the requester's smart contract, all of which does not require additional work to be done on the Ethereum network or any other public or private blockchain the smart contract is deployed on. With its unique proposition to serve as a bridge between traditional systems and smart contracts on blockchains, Chainlink serves as the most optimal candidate to fix the Oracle issue at the current moment, and its partnerships speak volume. Working with large companies such as Google Cloud and Oracle, as well as major crypto projects like Matic, Hedera Hashgraph, Seller, Wanchain, and legacy plays like Factum. And these are just a few of the partnerships that Chainlink has built, many of which have been made in the last few months. And for those of you who want to see a working product, the Chainlink mainnet is online as we speak. So maybe Chainlink is the solution to the Oracle problem. Maybe it is going to serve as the bridge between traditional systems and smart contracts. But a genuine question comes up that I think everyone should ask for any given cryptocurrency or token. And that is, where will the demand come from? How will demand be set for the token in order for it to hopefully see an increase in price over time? I've had a theory over the last few months that a variety of utility tokens, as well as Chainlink, will see their demand not through people going and acquiring the tokens on exchanges, but rather utilizing their services in traditional frameworks, meaning the traditional systems that they already use for all types of software-related services. And with the partnership with Google and Oracle that Chainlink has, I think this is already shaping up a clear picture. With Google and Oracle already providing an endless range of services and experimenting with blockchain-related services, it only feels natural that they would streamline those services through their platforms for their consumers. Meaning that when people go ahead and access services that are related to Chainlink, they won't even know that they're consuming tokens in the background. Google can facilitate this all in the background 
for its users. But again, I do want to stress that this is just a theory. The partnerships that Chainlink holds with Google and Oracle are completely real, however we don't know how they're going to materialize and how far they're really going to go. I guess time will have to tell, but it does speak to something very exciting. And the price is currently showing it. Chainlink has been one of the best performers in 2019, going up exponentially even comparative to Bitcoin, which has already had a great year. Now some of you out there might be curious about my short term expectations for Chainlink or where I think the chart is saying that it's going to go next, but I'm actually not going to do any TA on Chainlink. And the reason why is that to me, Chainlink is a bet. It's a long term bet that if there is going to be enterprise use case of blockchain, that they are going to need the Chainlink network in order to facilitate on solving the Oracle problem and to transpire real data to smart contracts. If Chainlink can do this, it will become a secondary essential layer to Ethereum and pretty much any other public or private blockchain. And that's where I believe that you could see Chainlink reach triple digit valuations on its price. At $100, that's about a $33 billion valuation for Chainlink. And I think in the next cycle, which is going to easily have a multitude of altcoins hitting double or triple digit territory in the billions for its market cap, I really see that as a possibility, as crazy as it sounds. So Chainlink is one of the few that I'm watching. The momentum that it's already had in 2018 and 2019 has already gotten me very excited. And I can't wait to see if they actually are able to solve the Oracle problem on mass scale. Well, anyways, guys, that's it for the video. I hope you all enjoyed my top 10 picks that I'm watching in 2020. If you guys liked the video, please drop a like down below as well as a comment on your top 10 coins or what you thought about my picks here on the video. Along with that, I just want to reiterate again the importance, guys, of understanding that this cycle is going to be very Bitcoin dominant. You've got to find players that have been able to keep up with the momentum and have more exciting things going on than the broader spectrum of what Bitcoin's been able to achieve. And that's going to be very difficult difficult in this next cycle, I personally believe. So anyways, guys, that's it for the video. Thank you all so much for watching. Trade smart, be patient, and do your own research. I'll see you guys in the next one.